around the, the planet really saying, hey, this is a cool idea. Can you set one up in, in, in my town in, in Sicily or in, or in Santa Monica? We couldn't physically do that travel, uh, but we wanted to share the idea with the world. So we created this uh, park, parking day how-to manual, which is essentially like an Ikea manual for the guerrilla art intervention. And this really enabled the project to go open source uh, and people now around the world, uh, you know, started recreating the parking installation in all different parts of the globe. Some of them quite simple, some quite elaborate. Uh, and then in 2006, we said, well, let's try to, let's try to focus energy and rally people around the globe who are interested in this to do it on one single day. And thus, uh, the Parking Day event was born. Um, we had a lot of help in creating Parking Day uh, early on from Trust for Public Land and from uh, the ASLA who were early kind of, they saw the, saw the kind of power of this idea and they really helped us take it to scale across the globe. Uh, in, in 2009, we held a competition for the Parking Day logo and we got a submittal from Maki Kawaguchi who, who now is one of my colleagues at Gell actually, and submitted this great design and now that's been the sort of banner uh, for, that continues, continues to be used around the world. Loved, you know, to see this creative innovation happening. So here on, on Cesar Chavez Street in the Mission District, uh, people set up a free temporary health clinic. People use it to promote the need for, you know, urban open space and, and for natural areas in our cities, or simply as a place to play and express our creativity outside of a kind of a commercial exchange. Uh, and the event has spread around the globe. Here's a, here's a parking day installation in Seoul, South Korea, and here's one in Tehran, Iran. So that, you know, for us, it was about a $500, you know, two hour intervention now has become a global uh, phenomena. Uh, in 2011, there was a thousand, close to a thousand parks on six continents. This was the 2011 map and the, and the, the event continues to grow. This year, 2020, uh, there's parking day installations in everywhere from Tacoma to Tokyo and everywhere in between. It's really quite remarkable how it's grown and evolved. I want to talk about the, you know, parking day as it relates to the larger movement of tactical urbanism. There's so many players involved in this. Rebar just played a small part, really. But one of the things that we were involved in early on was uh, the, 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 the parklets in San Francisco. So, in 2009, we were approached by uh, folks from the mayor's office of the city greening, um, Marshall Foster and Andres Power, and said, hey, we love your parking day idea. Um, can we formalize it a bit? Can we try to make it happen, you know, something that we can do year round? And so, you know, city of San Francisco realized that, wow, 30% of our city land area is streets and rights of way. That's more land than all of our public parks combined. What if we just started to shift the dial a little bit Bit on that space to make them more uh, welcoming and inviting to people. What would that look like? And so uh, working with Andres Power and, and folks from the planning and Office of Greening Department, we started to come up with a concept. Uh, they asked us to come up with a, a more permanent concept. We created something called the Walklet, which was this modular system, a kit of parts, you know, bike parking, seating, planting, shade. And we installed the first one at uh, 23rd and Bartlett in the Mission District. Um, uh, Andres, I think in this, you know, planning department said park, you know, walklet's cool, but actually we like the, we like the term parklet. And so the parklet, uh, I, uh, uh, name was created and the parklet program was born. Here was the early website from the city of San Francisco, you know, inviting people to test out this idea. We piloted the program, Rebar piloted the program with, as well as a number of other designers, uh, including, uh, 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 early parklet in front of uh, um, uh, in Hayes Valley and I think that one it continues to be out there today and so thus the parklet program was born so these started popping up and appearing in neighborhoods across San Francisco city of San Francisco quickly realized that huh these are only seem to be appearing in the areas where you know there's a lot of kind of social and political capital in the neighborhood we need to spread this program across the city and so they I, use this lens of geographic equity actually they start working with communities who didn't have parklets to try to uh, help them through the process and actually streamline and simplify the process to be able to take advantage of this program in their neighborhood. <clears throat> One of the things we really pushed for, we were really adamant about with San Francisco was that these have to be public space. This isn't an extension of, it's not like a commercial cafe table and chair seating permit. <clears throat> it's actually an extension of public space, an extension of the sidewalk into the curb lane. And so now every, one of these parklets in San Francisco has a little sign which says, this is public space. 
uh, and, the, and the program continues to grow. City of San Francisco really providing some incredible leadership in navigating the complex process between public works, MTA, planning, various city agencies to really streamline and make it much easier for an everyday citizen to navigate this permit application process. Uh, and thus, you know, City of San Francisco uh, planning department, you know, folks like Robin Abad uh, and many others in the planning department now have seeded and inspired parklet programs around the world. I think we thought that parklet would be like a gateway or a path toward a you know, permanent installation like a sidewalk a bulb open space typology in their own right and they're fulfilling an important niche in terms of testing an idea and this idea of flexible dynamic urbanism so city of philadelphia you know has their own park program miami los angeles uh, uh and now i think the latest is in nashville tennessee the civic design center in nashville is running a wonderful uh kind of virtual parking competition this year as well as a number of spaces set up in the city of nashville they're launching their own parklet program this year uh, in, in the meantime, City of San Francisco continues to grow and mature this offering and really coalesce a number of different tools uh, regarding, you know, uh, uh, improving public space in streets throughout the city. They have a great website now called Groundplay. It's an excellent model and it provides a real clear way, uh, whether you want to do a parklet or a street closure or any other types of intervention in the public realm, there's like a one-stop shop for you to get access to those uh, opportunities in San Francisco. This is also a great model we hope gets exported around the world. <clears throat> Meantime, Rebar, you know, uh, continues to kind of innovate and, and develop the project. In 2007, we created something called the Park Cycle, a mobile pedal powered public open space. We, we pedaled it through San Francisco and parked it right in Gavin Newsom's parking spot and uh, continued to evolve the project in 2013, uh, the, uh, collaborated with an artist, uh, in uh, Denmark, uh, Jan Sorben from N55 and Till Wolfer, who had created this fantastic um, design for a, uh, a cargo bike made out of uh, you know, uh, really easily accessible parts. We teamed up together to make something called Park Cycle Swarm, which was a temporary mobile distributed open space. They're individual bicycles, but then the uh, steering folds down and the landscape folds out so you can create a much larger aggregated open space and 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 you know bring a park where and when you need it just temporal distributed open space deployed by bicycle while i was in copenhagen working on this project i i happened to uh meet the folks at gell architects and just walking into the office you you get a sense that this is a different type of operation there's a sense that uh, people really care about the kind of places that we're trying to create around the globe. And I learned around about the work of Jan Gell, the Danish urbanist who 50 years ago started systematically observing public life in cities and created a framework for cities around the globe, including Copenhagen, to use public life as a driver for design decision making. I'm now a partner and director at Gell, as, as Vicky mentioned, and we work globally on city strategy and master planning and urban design and public space is our uh, kind of primary uh, wheelhouse, building upon Yan's legacy and really focusing on trying to amplify public life in cities, which is you know, one way of thinking about that is the life, we, what we create together when we spend time outside of our, you know, when we spend time outside together. Uh, as a practice, we focus on user experience, you know, design for how people, uh, how people think, uh, 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 behave, not how we think they behave and we use public life data to inform our design decision making. We get outside and we get our boots on the ground and we observe people walking, cycling, the age and gender presentation. And we also look at what's happening when people are spending time in public space. So all this data uh, goes to inform our public life studies that we've done around the world. So we can compare pedestrian activity in Nashville to San Francisco, New York or Shanghai and use that data to inform good design decision making that practice of utilizing public life data to inform design strategies is what helped Copenhagen go from a very typical, you know, uh, auto congested city center to the thriving city that it is today. It also helped us work with Mayor Bloomberg and Jeanette Sadi Khan in the, in the uh, Department of Transportation in New York City to transform Times Square. There was no square in Times Square until Gell showed up and pointed out that we can, uh, we can gradually shift the equation here by taking a page out of the book of tactical urbanism to try an idea and then use that evidence and data that we gather over those short-term trials to inform the long-term design. 
So now that was a quick background on, on, on rebar and the kind of emergence of tactical urbanism, the tactical urbanist toolkit. I want to talk now about what's happening in response to COVID and how uh, people are utilizing streets and right of ways in public space today for a whole new set of um, important uh, considerations. I'm going to turn for a moment to the city of Mountain View, California, a city of about a town of about 80,000 people uh, in the, uh, the southern part of the peninsula. It's the home of Google. Uh, it's right next to, to, to NASA and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful community. You know, they started doing innovation on there. They have a wonderful, uh, actually walkable downtown that was preserved, you know, they decided to protect their kind of the downtown close to the, the train stop, the Caltrain stop. And they started innovating in, uh, you know, in, in street design in the 90s. This is a, a Mountain View's version, what they call flex zone, where the part, the curb lane here actually can become outdoor dining or parking. Uh, this was the design from the 90s. Uh, it's, it's, it's due for a renewal kind of needs an upgrade. And so the city asked us to come, uh, you know, we, we won an RFP actually to uh, uh, do a one year feasibility study of potentially pedestrianizing one block of Castro Street. Along comes COVID, you know, the economic development department says our downtown is dying. You know, our, our, our small businesses are suffering. We need to work and, and move as fast as we can to open up space for outdoor dining and any activities we can do outside to save our our downtown and the small businesses. So we pivoted uh, the project and began working with the city of Mountain View on what we called summer streets. So a four block closure, you know, uh, started in June, uh, again, helping them orchestrate how do you organize, you know, places for movement, places for staying, places for commercial seating, but also places for public seating. This is one of the innovative things that I think Mountain View has done. You know, we use the idea of, of super graphics and branding to communicate uh, 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 social distancing guidelines and requirements and to help uh, vendors organize their seating. And then we created an invitation for people to participate in shaping some of that, doing some of the, the street painting, all, all pages right out of Parking Day and out of the Tactical Urbanism Toolkit. Uh, in early June, we got out there on the street with the uh, planning department and folks from transportation, many other city, uh, city family in Mountain View and got out there and, and laid it out on the street and a couple weeks later, Summer Streets was open for business and the, immediately those adjacent restaurants and businesses spill out into the street. Uh, it's been hugely successful. You know, restaurants uh, are now back up to about 50% capacity. And, you know, there's these shared dining spaces which are public seating. It's a really nice, I think, framework for a combination of both supporting, of course, you want to support small businesses, but you also want to make sure that you're being generous in terms of how you treat public space. Uh, and so this is now, uh, was launched in June. It was supposed to go through um, uh, September. The city council just decided to extend it through the end of the year. This is the before, this is the after. And, and we're trying to, you know, learn what we can from this to help inform long-term changes in the street. These types of measures are happening across the country. You know, whether it's street closures or fare suspension on, on public transit or, or bike share, Temporary bike lanes, you know, happening across the globe, uh, also happening across the globe. Uh, San Francisco has quickly launched their own shared spaces program. I think Robin Abad uh, is also a key part of this. And they now have this wonderful dashboard, which, which you, can, you can see uh, the kind of how many folks are applying for these various types of sidewalk and curbside permits or street closures is blown up. It's happening, happening all over the city. Um, you know, similarly, changes happening during COVID, uh, increase in utilization of bike chair, a huge amount of increase in scooter, trip, scooter trips, um, and, and, and sadly, a, a decline in transit ridership and, and really a kind of, um, uh, uh, yeah, a kind of shrinking of our transit rider base in what was otherwise a very successful uh, municipal transportation system in San Francisco and continues through the efforts of the MTA. I want to point out that, you know, some of the, the, the sort of um, less successful side of these open streets programs. So City of Oakland also, you know, uh, has a great equity focus in terms of their DOT. They rolled out a shared streets, open streets program throughout many, many different neighborhoods. And yet I, I think they didn't do as much as they could have in terms of reaching out to community partners to shape, well, how do you want this to look like in your neighborhood? Do you agree this is the right set of moves, you know, to happen in, in your area? And really, I think, you know, these uh, open streets programs and temporary uses 
have exposed uh, the deep and, 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 and existing inequities in who and how has access to public space. How you show up to public space has a lot to do with your socioeconomic background and the degree, the degree to which your city, your community is subject to do police brutality or not, or other factors that may or may not allow you to enjoy, you know, riding a bike or a scooter. And you may have the, you may, the only choice you may have in terms of safe movement through, through your city may be in a car. And so we really need to address, you know, how these programs are rolled out, but also the fundamental inequities in terms of how we use our streets. And that's the opportunity, I think, in front of us with this program. So I want to ask, you know, how do we leverage the changes during COVID-19 into long-term improvements for our streets in terms of safety, in terms of sustainability, in terms of equity? I don't have the answers. I'm just kind of putting it out there, but I wanted to throw out a couple ideas and then I'm hoping we can get into a discussion. I love this quote from Dan Rather, maybe when this is all over, we can just widen the sidewalks. You know, great, wouldn't that be a great outcome? I think there's four key things to leveraging short-term temporary uh, open streets programs, parklet programs, closures for long-term change. The first is to recognize that we need to fundamentally look at our own patterns of behavior. You know, there's a great quote here from uh, Jeffrey Tumlin, as we struggle to breathe in California here due to, due, due to the wildfires and smoke, let's remember corporations or developers aren't the problem, it's us driving our cars. Only collective action will make California survivable can you help by reducing the miles you drive? And he you know, puts this graph about carbon emissions you know, in, in the US, and we need to recognize that 40% of those emissions come from the transportation sector, and about 30% of that comes from passenger vehicles. So whereas I agree, I agree with, with Jeffrey that you know, uh, personal transportation choices are part of the problem, I disagree that it's, it's as simple as, can you stop driving? You know, people need to have choices uh, in order to make a different type of a decision in terms of their mo mobility choice. Turning back to Copenhagen for a second, you know, Copenhagen's been a remarkable, remarkable success story. People talk about, oh, it's a cycling city, uh, and it's true. You know, 60% of people in downtown Copenhagen and even, in, you know, 50% in the larger area are cycling to work. Imagine that for a second. In your city, if over half of the trips in your city happened by bicycle, what that would do in terms of air quality, what that would do in terms of your personal health. But when you ask Copenhageners, you know, why is it that you ride the bicycle? Is it because it's the environmental choice? No. Is it because it's cheap? Maybe. Is it because it's good for, good for exercise? Maybe. It, Copenhageners choose to cycle because it's quick, easy, and convenient. You know, people don't change the behavior when you tell them to stop driving. People change their behavior when the culture and context compels them to. We need to create the conditions in more of our cities and towns and rural areas where people have mobility choice that is, uh, allows them to make a choice beyond uh, just driving, which as we know is a significant contributor to carbon emissions. Second key is of course having strong policy. When we're talking about curb lane policy, you gotta talk about this guy and refer to the work of Donald Shoup, who wrote an 800 page book called The High Cost of Free Parking. He's also known as Shoup Dog, really great guy. He's been a long time parking day ally and supporter. You can break down uh, Don's 800 page book into three key points. Remove requirements for off street parking. That makes it easier to, to do uh, infill development. And actually, if you're not sacking and burdening smaller uh, parcels or smaller lots with uh, off street parking requirements, you gotta start, start charging prices. You gotta uh, charge the right price for street parking and then take the revenue and invest that back into the public realm or in your community, invest it into an equitable access, invest it back into affordable housing. Take that parking meter revenue that you're now charging appropriately for and put it back into some kind of public benefit. Case study, many of you in the, in the SoCal ASLA community probably know quite well, probably better than I do is the you know, um, old Pasadena story in the 50s, you know, similar to many uh, communities throughout the US, white flight, People moving out to the suburbs, you know, uh, disinvestment in our downtown. So by the 1970s, old El Paso was struggling. You know, there there was um, <clears throat> a lot of less socially acceptable types of commerce and business happening there, and it just wasn't a thriving area in terms of economic development for the city. And uh, but uh, Pasadena just did just that. They followed Shoup's guidance. They started pricing parking. They built separate uh, parking structures connected to the major vehicular circulation routes and they started charging appropriately for street parking and then putting that revenue right back into the public realm. Now, Old El Paso is thriving. 
it, it's a huge economic driver for the city of Pasadena and people come there because they have the experience of being able to walk safely and encounter people of different backgrounds in a wonderfully restored town center. That's the, the, the how you use great policy to, 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 to change our streets for the better. Third point, it's really crucial, you know, that we take this moment to prioritize geographic and social equity. So I want to talk about an example of Gail's work from uh, Mexico uh, in the city of the Mexico City. We developed the Me Mexico City bike strategy in 2012. The Department of Transportation, rather than do bike lanes in the city center first, you know, around the, the central business district, they said, no, we're going to build that infrastructure where there's the greatest need, which is actually on the periphery of the city, where people depended upon biking to get to work or get to school. It wasn't an option for them. It wasn't a choice. That's where they made the infrastructure investment first. And then they moved into the inner city build out a more success story. Other example I want to talk about, you know, the DOT in Oakland has, has learned a lot and, and really has a strong equity focus in their investments, in their work. They're creating an East Oakland Mobility Action Plan. And it's not just a top-down plan. They're working with a, an organization called the East Oakland Collective, which is doing their own neighborhood and community-based, you know, mobility equity programs. They're now partnering with the city of Oakland to shape this mobility the action plan. That's a great example. Um, I want to talk about a little bit more of Gell's work with uh, the scooter provider Spin. You know, Spin realized, huh, in order to really show up in cities in a way where we're going to be welcome and accepted, we need to have a strong equity lens in our work. Where do we locate our scooter pods? Where do we, how, where do we deploy these? How can we leverage our, you know, infrastructure to actually enhance mobility enhanced mobility access for disadvantaged communities and populations. Here's downtown San Jose, uh, jobs available via transit without scooter access and with the scooter access. All of a sudden you open up a lot more economic opportunity connected to mobility through thinking through this kind of social and geographic equity lens in your investments. Okay, fourth point is you gotta measure what you care about. This is Yan's, what I learned from Yan and, and, and the folks at Gell. What we care about is public life. We need to measure it. Every city is doing a traffic or parking count twice a year. Are you actually measuring the thing you care about, which is public life? We got out in, in uh, Scandinavia and started uh, observing how people were using public space during the pandemic. It was quite interesting what we found. And we have now turned our public life tools into a very easy to use uh, web-based app. It's called the Public Life Platform. You can connect to it through the web, through your smartphone or tablet and get out there and start surveying public space in your community. How are these spaces working? Who's showing up to my Open Streets event? Who's absent? You know, are, is there an absence of children, an absence of elders? Um, who's out there and who's not there? How do we use that data to inform good design decision making? We've added to the, the Public Life app this way to quickly evaluate, you know, how, whether or not people are adhering to social distancing, uh, distancing guidelines so we can give quick feedback to the cities we're working with to say, yeah, you have to, we have to update uh, the design here to better communicate uh, the kind of health code guidelines. This was utilized in West Palm Beach. We started looking at how people were utilizing the streets and public spaces during COVID and also identifying the sites where people were or were not practicing social distancing. They went back in you know, with the, those communities and partners to say, all right, we have to, we have to upgrade our communication here to better, um, better communicate adherence to social distancing guidelines. So those are my four key points. Parking Day this year, we just relaunched the Parking Day site, myparkingday.org. I hope you can join. We ha also have a globe, we got the global map up and running again. This is, uh, this is the, the 15th annual Parking Day. It's part of a much broader movement. You know, I need to thank uh, my collaborators at Rebar, um, Matthew Passmore, Blaine Merker, Teresa, and all the folks who were part of that original Parking Day, and then all the folks since who have been major contributors to the growth of this movement. I also want to thank all my colleagues at GEL. We are working together to make cities for people around the globe. And thank all of you for being part of this today. You can connect. You can find me at uh, john at gelpeople.com or uh, look at the GEL website or my website. Um, and, uh, and so now I'd like to turn it over and to uh, Corey to host some questions about how do we leverage you know, temporary um, street projects uh, to, for long-term change in our cities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's great to hear that again. It's uh, super, um, we're super grateful to just have you have that conversation with us and be able to explain that. And um, so if anyone has any questions, if you didn't hear at the beginning, feel free to type a question out. We'll be going through a Q&A 
Um, we do have three right now. So if you have any questions that you heard, um, you know, when you joined or if you had anything that popped up, we'll go through a, a Q&A session here for the remainder of time that we have in, or until we run out. But um, I'll start it off. We uh, just go in chronological order. We have two uh, questions from Peter Mueller. Uh, the first one is, is anyone else offering virtual parking day postings and self-guided virtual tours this year, similar to AIA San Francisco? Uh, I, I, this, uh, Nashville Civic Design, or the Civic Design Center uh, in Nashville is also uh, doing a virtual parking day tour today. They, they did a great uh, design competition, a virtual design competition. You know, several months ago, we weren't sure whether or not we'd be able to do any physical parking day installations at all. But uh, they have set up a great design competition around a number of themes, and I think they're also doing a virtual tour today. Peter uh, reached out to me earlier today and, and, and talked about the AIA virtual tour, which sounds so cool. And I'm hoping we can, uh, you know, uh, leverage that and build upon that momentum for future parking days. I think it's such a, such a great idea. Awesome. Second question he had was, how can we encourage San Francisco shared spaces users to consider giving back to the public realm in an enhanced way after the pandemic response restrictions on indoor use are permanently relaxed? Well, that's a really great and important question. You know, one, one of the things which I think has been um, a potentially negative outcome of the, um, the uh, commercial dining, you know, expansion to the curb lane, some of those very early temporary parklets were very much focused on the necessity of, you know, getting tables and chairs out for their patrons. But I think uh, their presence on the street was rather, um, uh, it was formidable, formidable, and it didn't feel very inviting. Now I think the next generation has said, oh yeah, we have to, you know, we're out in the public realm. This isn't inside our restaurant. This is part of public space. We need to be generous in terms of how we reach out and how we communicate through design, you know, that this is actually an invitation uh, for the public to be part of this. So one key thing is I think about some simple guidelines for the temporary outdoor uses that uh, uh, really don't block the sidewalk, don't have walls over 42 inches, you know, enable people to see in and see through and see, you know, see out of the dining spaces so that they're much more inviting for folks. And then, you know, long term, I think, um, I, you know, I think we can expect that these types of measures are going to be in place for at least the next three to six months. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very curious how we leverage this for, for long-term change. I'd be curious to hear uh, Peter or others comments on how, how do we uh, kind of move this forward and translate in, into long-term change. All right, the next one is uh, not a question, but um, love how your concept has really evolved into what is now uh, some restaurants and businesses, their only option to continue to stay open in this COVID response. So more of a, a grateful response there. Uh, next one is from, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, but Riddy. Um, how would you advise approaching the design of bike lanes in tropical countries where the massive need to reduce car dependency, but the weather isn't all conducive to everyday cycling? Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. And, you know, I think this is where the combination of walking and biking infrastructure really overlaps well with green infrastructure investments. Um, you know, you can see in a lot of um, uh, Chinese cities, actually, where they're dealing with significant uh, airborne pollution and contaminants, they do, they heavily invest in uh, tree planting uh, alongside and adjacent and above their um, active mobility facilities. And it's, you know, there, I think, I think, and, and, and I know this is true with uh, landscape architects here in the U.S. too, that trees aren't just uh, sort of to look at. Trees perform, right? They perform in some crucial and incredible functions for us, both in terms of, you know, being the living ecosystem of forests that we all love and admire, but also in cities, doing the critical work of providing shade, of mitig mitigating airborne contaminants, of mitigating heat island effects. So I think, for, for me, I think part of the, part of the answer is, um, you know, investing in active mobility infrastructure and green infrastructure significant tree planting, or if you can't do it with trees, think about, use it, think about using building architecture, think about using canopies, think about using other types of enclosure where you can uh, protect uh, and, and, and provide that shade for 
um, for, for, for cyclists. And, and look, if they can do it in Mexico City, if you can do it in Brazil, if you can do it in, uh, you know, in, in India, in, in southern China with hotter climates, I think you can do it in a lot of many parts of the globe. All right, next one is from Michael. Uh, Long Beach has an open streets initiative where Public Works provides water filled, water filled, filled excuse me, K walled and parking spaces in front of a shop within a few weeks of an application. There are now over 200 in our city. Many folks, including our mayor, are now reconsidering if these should be permanent. Seems like one viable process. Yes, so I think uh, just like Nashville, you know, and the Civic Design Center have really leveraged the kind of temporary uh, events of parking day to advocate for uh, creating a parklet program in their city. That's the process that uh, we use in San Francisco. It's, it's, a, it's a step by step, right? You got to build the momentum. You have to build the constituency. You have to actually communicate, um, you know, uh, through design and through experience about what the possibilities are when we think differently about how we use the curb lane. But then, then the real work begins in terms of, you know, interdepartmental collaboration. So you got to get public works and your transportation agencies and your planning folks on board. You also have to again have think about geographic equity and how you roll these programs out. But the platforms are out there. You know, the, 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 the ground play example I shared, the City of San Francisco Parklet Program is, is a great template for how you create the policy tools and literally the kind of permitting language to roll these out in your city. You know, the way it's done in San Francisco is that um, the city exerts its power to issue a permit, right? And there's a, there's a, there's a, a modest permit application fee uh, the, 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 um, the project sponsor builds the parklet and maintains it, right? And if they don't do the maintenance, if they don't sort of hold up their end of the bargain in terms of maintaining it, in terms of making it both useful for their patrons, but also inviting to the public, the city has the power to kind of revoke uh, that permit. And they've done that in cases where the parklets aren't abiding to the kind of standards that we hold. So that's a key role that the city can play is both sort of enforcing some good design guidelines. And then also, as I mentioned, really, you know, creating opportunity in terms of, uh, of, of equitable access to the program in parts of the city that maybe don't have the same kind of social or political capital as the downtown may or some wealthier neighborhoods may. It's really about you know, trying to deploy these uh, things where and when they're needed. Uh, and really, you know, as the, as the folks at NACTO say, uh, serving the most vulnerable populations first. You know, how you go from parking day to a, a parklet program, there's a lot of great case studies out there. I would, I would look at the ground play website as a key and maybe reach out to Robin Abad in San Francisco, who may be able to share with you uh, the kind of parklet permit process, the internal process that was used to generate uh, permit structure. This is great. I'd love to see all the questions coming in too. Um, if you have questions, please send them out. We're getting some good some good feedback here and uh, please take advantage of this opportunity with, with John Bella. Um, so the next question is from Dr. David uh, Sadaway. Um, there's a two-parter here, so it was a follow-up he sent a little bit later. Um, interesting presentation. Thanks here in Vancouver, Canada. Pre-COVID, we faced serious housing um, asymmetries, uh, asymmetries, trees, excuse me. Now COVID has brought out even more precariousness for hard to house and house House of situations, um, couch surfers essentially. How can designers better address twin housing and environmental justice issues in the public realm? And then he also says, and how can we avoid these great uh, ideas serving as just tools for further gentrification? I think that's a, a key a key question, and and that's why you know one of my four main points was about social and geographic equity in terms of how you translate. You know, these, well, first of all, how you deploy the short-term uh, uh, programs, but then also how you scale this and, and how you guide investment over time. You know, one of the things that COVID, the COVID crisis has revealed is the fundamental inequity in our streets. Who has access? Who does not have access? Who has a choice or not to spend time in the public realm? You know, our, our underhoused population in San Francisco, they're out in the street because they have no choice. And we need to recognize that under underneath you know, the efforts to improve public space, there's deeper work to do in terms of our affordable housing policies. Um, you know, one of the, one of the th interesting, I think, policy tools coming out of Donald Shoup's work is, you know, use parking revenue to invest in the public realm and to provide equitable access to, to public space. And maybe there's some interesting, I think there's some good, good clues in terms of, you know, how we can leverage uh, parking revenue 
to possibly even direct towards affordable housing programs uh, or, or, or you know, uh, social programs for the less privileged uh, people in our communities. Um, you know, the, the, the global housing crisis is, uh, it, it's, it's a big issue uh, all up and down the West Coast. It's, cer it's certainly a huge issue in San Francisco and I also know in Vancouver, you know, I think there's some deeper work we need to do in terms of incentivizing the growth of housing you know, Scott Weiner in San Francisco has done a lot of work to try to make it easier to, in California, to build housing near transit. It's a big issue and it's not gonna be solved through something like Parking Day, but I do believe that everyone, you know, deserves access to great public space. And, and in terms of, you know, public space is our shared commons. And if we disinvest in the commons, we, um, we don't create the opportunity you know, for, uh, for us to kind of sh share and, and to interact with one another, no matter what our backgrounds come from. Also have to recognize that the way people show up in public space, their ability to even go out into a street or out into their neighborhoods is very much shaped by gr greater forces at work, whether it's pr police brutality or, or whether it's, um, you know, safe streets, whether it's lighting on the sidewalks that allows them to walk to school or walk to work or bike to school there's significant inequity in how you know public realm investment has occurred. The thing is, and you know, Yan says this all the time. You know, it's like bike lane and, and, and sidewalks are cheap, and I know they're not going to solve housing, but they certainly can help in terms of these sort of humble investment in public realm, public space, in terms of you know transit stops, in terms of connecting to, um, you know, making it easier to walk, bike, or take transit or scoot to work. Um, you know, these are all things that we, we, they're fundamentals in terms of making humane and habitable cities. And we need to start where the greatest need is. Got some really good questions coming in. I've been reading. So um, thank you all for, for posting those and encourage you all to do more if you have some. Um, another one from Peter Mueller. So as more merchants invest more resources into pandemic responses like the San Francisco Shared Spaces Program, does it make sense to encourage communities to require licensed design professionals for next generation of street and sidewalk? Should there be an expedited design review? Hmm. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I mean, you know, one of the things I, I think the fundamental tenets of parking day is this idea of user, user generated urbanism, which is that you don't have to be, you know, an urban planner or design professional in order to express yourself in, in the street. Um, and, and I think that works quite well for, for parking day. I, I will say that with, you know, with something like a, a parklet, a more permanent intervention in the public realm, it does make sense to work with a designer and find a designer in your community, uh, you know, to, to work with. Um, there's a lot of design firms out there who are willing to do uh, pro bono work with communities. There's, you know, public architectures, um, a one plus program which connects um, connects designers with communities in need. So there's a strong role for design in shaping public realm once you get to something more permanent like a parklet or, or, or open space or a transit stop. So a strong role for designers and at the same time we, we want to lower the barrier to entry so that more people feel like oh I do have an opportunity to shape part of my city and improve my city and I'm, I'm invited to do that. Um, you know I think that's one that's been one of the challenges I think of um, you know, a city as well run and managed as Vancouver. It's an incredible, they have amazing public spaces. They have incredible investment in transit. And yet sometimes they're, they're lacking the public participation. You know, they, they, they wish that there was uh, more ways to get more types of people out uh, into the street, you know, participate, participate, participating in civic action beyond just coming to a planning meeting and looking at a plan or a graph or a model. That's what I think is great about parking day. It really lowers the barrier to entry for everyone who feels like they want to be part of shaping, you know, public space and they want to contribute to public space. They can do that and they don't have to have a design degree to kind of get out there and, and, and have some fun. Awesome. Next one comes from John Jacobs. Vancouver, um, we'll, st we'll stick in Canada and Vancouver right now. Vancouver is getting pushback for reserving a lane in our most important park for bicycles. Bike usage increase about eight to 10 times, but bike usage will decrease in winter and the car lobby will push to re, uh, for a return to the old system. Suggestions and examples on preserving public benefits when the weather is not our friend. 
Yeah, great question. And, and one of the key considerations in our work with Vancouver is how do we extend the seasons? You know, how do we address that for a large part of the year, the weather's not great uh, and it's less inviting for people to spend outside, you know, to spend time outdoors. A couple considerations there. One is you got to get the data. Get out there and measure how many people are walking and biking during the COVID recovery efforts and put that data in front of your city council member, the planning officials say, yes, we've had 10,000 cyclists a day here and we expect some measure of that to continue. You, gotta, you, have to get the, you have to get the information to be able to kind of build your case and build your story. So getting out there and getting the public life data is key. Um, I think the, 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 um, the, the, the second piece in terms of season extension is like, let's look towards some of uh, you know, the cities that are, are, are in, in, in harsher climates, like you know, Copenhagen, Oslo are great examples in terms of how they do season extension, you know, whether it's um, simply offering blankets you know, for patrons so they can extend another half an hour into the evening or investing in providing that rain or shade uh, cover over, over an outdoor space or simply thinking about investing in more facilities that provide rain cover. Um, so there's an infrastructure component and then there's a program component. So cities like uh, Winnipeg in Canada, very cold, very harsh climate for a significant part of the year. They get thousands of people out for their, um, their linear ice rink and their um, uh, warming hut design competition. So getting creative about how you create invitations for people in colder climates to get outside, to incentivize them to get outdoors is another big part of the equation. So get the data, invest in season extending infrastructure, invest in a winter programming strategy to get people out, you know, during during this winter months. We're about to face this in California with all of our outdoor dining. It's been hugely, hugely successful. We're now allowed to do, I think, 50% capacity indoor dining, but, you know, I'm praying that the rains will come. And when they do come, we're going to have to rethink, you know, how, we, how do we provide rain cover in open streets? How do we, uh, you know, uh, enhance and continue to provide access to the outdoor space that people need even during inclement weather? All right, we've got uh, just about 10 minutes left. So thank you to all who have hung on for so long and, uh, and enjoyed this, this process. I encourage everyone who is still with us, if they have questions, please ask them to get them in. Uh, we do have a few more we're gonna go through. Um, the next one, um, I already know John has a, a, an answer for, but um, this is from Douglas Short, who is part of our chapter here in Southern California. Um, he says, I think that the first step in codifying these changes into future plans is to document how they are working in this extraordinary time. Documenting how these dramatic changes are employed and how they are performing is something we could all be doing. Totally agree. And, and we're trying to make that easier through, you know, tools like our, our public life, uh, public life platform, web-based app, but you know, you don't need that. All you need is a ped counter. Get out there and start, you know, observing, observing people and share that data with your city council member. You know, uh, one, of the things we, one of the things we've done with uh, various efforts around uh, temporary activities like the Market Street Prototyping Festival is we reached out to our community and said, hey, who would like to become a public life volunteer and go and observe and talk to people in the street and see how these things are working or how they're not working? And how can we use that information that we've gathered with community participants, you know, to really help give important feedback to the city? So. You know, I think some, some people are concerned about data and data privacy, but one thing I want to emphasize, you know, with Gell's approach is that it's about, we actually train, uh, train you with the tools. So it's not Gell going to observe your city or your behavior, it's you observing yourself and building a shared vocabulary around what's actually happening out in public space. You know, like I said, every city is measuring traffic, right? They're, they're continually monitoring traffic to understand level of service on our streets or vehicle miles traveled or the parking counts, you know, increasingly the most successful cities are also doing the same thing with people and with public life. So completely agree. We're, you know, our whole aim as a practice is to get these tools out there. You know, there's lots of um, uh, information on our website, our website about how to do public life studies. If you need more help, reach out to me, but yeah, we're really trying to build a movement toward elevating, you know, uh, elevating public life and people in terms of how we design our cities. Definitely. And Gail is, is on the uh, forefront of that. I can speak to that uh, personally. Uh, the next question is from uh, Ray. How can we get parking day to India? 
come uh, by, um, well, there's the parking day how-to manual. Um, if, um, if that needs to be translated into, uh, into a, a language that's suitable for wherever you are, let me know. Uh, send me an email and we can translate the how-to manual. But that's really the first step is, uh, you know, describing how it's done, finding, you know, connecting with your local design community, connecting with your local advocacy groups. We've really seen uh, the effort spread across the globe, you know, whether it's in, in, you know, South Korea or Tehran or Brazil. I'm surprised that we haven't seen any in the Indian subcontinent yet. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if, if, if there's a, a barrier in terms of language, uh, let me know. Or if it's just about connecting with designers in your community and activists in community, that could be a good, a good next step. All right, the next one is um, an anonymous attendee. What is the best approach to transitioning parking day of the temporary public spaces to a culture and lifestyle and really no longer an event slash next step? Philadelphia has been doing it since 2008 and we feel, we feel it's contributed to the seasonal pop-up parklets, permitting, et cetera. Or do we just leave parking day as it is? It does seem more accessible. How do we leverage parking day uh, organizers to do as, uh, municipalities turn to make us change? Yes, and that's, I think that's the kind of core question, you know, I, I, I'm trying to ask here, and I would go back to those four key points, you know, um, it's about personal choices we make, it's about establishing great policy, it's about a social and geographic equity lens, and then it's you get that public life data. I, you know, I, I've been surprised. Uh, I thought that parking day was going to fade out and disappear. Uh, because the parklet programs were going and it was getting more formalized in cities and cities were taking that step to create a policy or a permit program to make this more permanent or they were beginning to invest more significantly in transit or they, they were beginning to change parking parking policy to reduce parking minimums for new development. I sort of thought uh, parking day would disappear but I, I guess you know it, it, it turns to still have a lot of agency um, because it is um, so easy to be to participate in. You don't need to be a professional designer. You just need to be someone who cares about your streets and about public space and, 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 and to get out there. And so I think it'll continue to have a role as long as we are still, we as citizens in our towns and cities across the globe need to find a way to advocate for safer streets, more equitable streets, streets where we can express our culture and creativity in, 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 in some new ways. So today, you know, it's, it's COVID, which I think is really driving a lot of the, 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 um, the activity um, in our streets. Who knows what the next, um, next uh, factor will be. You know, one thing that surprised me was that the work in Mountain View didn't come from planning, didn't come from public works. It came from the economic development, uh, development department. And this is where, you know, getting that data, the public life data, but also the economic impact data in terms of how are these shared spaces and open spaces uh, impacting um, our local businesses. Conversations with business owners in, in Mountain View, you know, pre-COVID, you know, one particular business had 10 staff. During the lockdown, they, they had to lay a bunch of people off. They were down to two staff. Now with the uh, summer streets program, they're back up to about 50% capacity. You know, in as much as we talk about geographic and social equity in, in how these streets programs are rolled out, we also have to recognize that there's a huge equity component re related to the jobs here, right? So a third of the people in this country are working in service jobs, and a lot of those people are out of work now. So there's a really big equity component to enabling, you know, and our small businesses to open and to survive and thrive. So some cities have been able to move faster. Some cities are still... Trying to, trying to figure out which policy tools to, 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 to get out there. But what, what I think we found, you know, is that San Francisco basically just said, we're gonna, we're gonna remove the obstacles, you know, with their shared spaces program and, and Robin Abad's work and many others in San Francisco and, and Jeff Tumlin, you know, we're gonna remove the obstacles and see what happens. And if we then need to come back in and adjust and fine tune, we'll do that. But we wanna create the invitation for people to take action on their own to really try to solve uh, the kind of pressing need. And I think that's what's, that's what's happened. Yeah. The uh, next question is from Anke, and I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. As we allow more private businesses to create parklets or patio sidewalks, how do we ensure they remain open to the general public, not just an extension of the business space? What design features help with this? 
Well, that's an excellent question. So pertinent and, and, and so valuable. You know, I think, um, you know, some of the guidelines around parklets are, are pretty applicable, I think, even to these temporary spaces. So one thing is um, don't enclose the parklet in a way where it feels like a wall, where it feels like you're privatizing that portion of the curb lane. You have to lower the barriers, allow visual transparency in and out of the parklet. Second thing is, um, you know, think about ways uh, to, 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 to utilize that seating, you know, even if your restaurant's not, not open, perhaps you can do some permanent intervention, some things that it, that's gonna give back to the public realm even when the restaurant isn't open. Things like free Wi-Fi, things like parking, or th things like planting and greenery um, uh, that can actually give, give back to the public realm. Uh, you know, uh, City of San Francisco is exploring some zoning frameworks, which are, I think, maybe one of the long-term changes that it, that's emerging out of COVID, which is that, can we be more flexible with our zoning so that if there's a ground floor, you know, that's used as a restaurant from four to eight, can, can it be utilized for some other, fulfill some kind of other neighborhood need, you know, during the day, whether it's for a daycare or for a working space or for, for some other need. I think that's a good lens to think about and apply to the kind of commercial table and chair permit. On the one hand, they're serving a very fundamental need to get these businesses open again and to provide the jobs and to provide the kind of amenity for, for the downtowns. On the other hand, if they feel like it's a privatization of space, they're not gonna succeed in the long term. That's why when we you know, were, were involved with the city of San Francisco uh, in the early days, the pilots that became the Parker program, we really pushed for the fact that these are public space each of them has a sign which says, this is public space. You don't have to buy a cup of coffee to sit here, you know? And that's really key to the program that they're, as much as they're serving the commercial need, they're also an act of generosity. Uh, John King, uh, a reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, wrote a great piece um, a couple weeks ago about precisely those kind of design guidelines that could really improve these temporary commercial outdoor seating to make them more generous, to make them more public. All right, next one is um, another one from Peter Mueller. So regarding the next steps, could a more flexible parklet that is adaptable over time be like a laboratory for its neighborhood? I, I love that idea. And, and one thing that we're exploring more and more in the cities we're working with is, yeah, temporal use, you know, whether it's over the course of the day or a week or the weekend, or maybe it's seasonal, you know? So uh, for the, the person who mentioned um, the roadways through uh, the Vancouver open space, maybe it's a seasonal closure, right? When you, when you know you're going to have 10,000 bikes an hour, maybe you do the lane closure during that time. It's, we don't have to be so rigid in terms of how we think about, is, is it open or closed? Is it, is it pedestrian or is it vehicular space? I think there's, a, there's ways to think about flexibility over time, both in terms of time of the day and year. So if you design a street well, you know, and we've been doing a lot of these types of street designs now, they're called shared streets where they work very well for pedestrians and cycles, but they also work well for service and delivery and drop offs when that, uh, those activities need to occur. So totally encourage you know, flexible use over, over, the, the, uh, over, the, over the season and over the year. It has to be built in, you know, in terms of really uh, robust design moves. That wraps up the, the questions that were submitted. Um, I, I do have one for you just personally, because I can't help myself. Um, you know, with COVID, we've, this has all been coming to surface. And, you know, while we celebrate Parking Day once a year, every year, this, this is a opportunity for not just landscape architects, urbanist designers, um, architects, or anyone therein to capitalize on it. How does the general public use their voices or their actions to make it stick? Because I, I can personally say I, I enjoy going and sitting at a restaurant outside versus inside, you know, nine out of 10 times, depending on the weather. But I'm in Southern California, but how do we how do we cast our votes, not just as um, designers? How do we cast our votes as just people? It's a great, great question, Corey. And I think one of the fundamental ways is, you know, find out how you can participate in the existing uh, public processes in your town or your city. So show up to that Zoom council meeting and let your voice be heard. You know, it's too often in our public processes, only the sort of small but vocal minority gets heard. And you may love a space, but you don't have the incentive to sort of get involved and, and share your voice when you want to share something positive. <laughs> we often go to public when we're like angry or pissed <laughs> off when we're 
about something, we need to have as much energy around wanting to create something. And so I think a really important first step is to get that data, you know, but also get, show up at your public meetings, talk to your council person, talk to your, uh, you know, local, local designer and say, hey, how can, we, how can we build some momentum? How can we do our own, you know, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram group to build some political momentum for these changes. Cause that's what, that's what's needed ultimately is like, you know, the mayor or the council person, the council person, they're going to listen to what they're hearing from their constituents. And if all they're hearing is like, is that, no, we don't want this from a small group of people. You need to overwhelm the naysayers with the positive stories, but also really ground that in the reality of what's happening. You know, are people using this space? Is it having a positive impact on the local economy? Is it inviting for, you know, black indigenous people of color or not? And if not, why? And, and so really use that data to do better design, but also to build a, a kind of advocacy for the kind of cities we want to, you know, the kind of spaces we want to be in our towns and cities. Oh, I love that answer. Thank you for that. Um, and I will there. Yeah. So to answer John's question, um, yes, it will be um, it has been recorded. It will be online. It's um, um, our ASLA Southern California website. Um, so this entire thing will be able to be shared. I'll end my portion by just saying thank you so much, John. I really appreciate your time and offering to um, educate us all, myself included, on what you're doing, what Parking Day means, and how we can expand it. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation, and I couldn't have done this without you and your help. So, yeah. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate it. Happy parking and happy day, parking day. <laughs> yes, happy parking day. <laughs>